Welcome to the Peep Show Podcast. Your glance at sex, society, and culture. With Jesse and PJ Sage. Hello, we are sorry to have taken such a long break from the podcast. We had a bunch of changes in our professional lives and had to readjust, but we are back and we are super happy to be here. Thanks for being so patient with us. In the time that we've been gone, there have been a lot of changes in our sex work community with the passage of FOSTA and SESTA. We are going to take time to talk to Kate Diadamo from Survivors Against SESTA about what these bills are and what sort of impact they will have on the sex industry. We will also give you two more interviews from our time at AVN. We'll be talking to Wesley Woods from I Want empire about their gay clip division and his career in gay porn we will also be talking to chelsea poe from trouble films about her porn career her trans activism and her roots as a music promoter Kate Diamo is a longtime sex worker, right advocate, and former community organizer with a focus on economic justice, criminalization, and public health, and a partner with Reframe Health and Justice. Previously, she has worked as a national policy advocate at the Sex Worker Project and a community organizer with the Sex Worker Outreach Project New York City and Sex Worker Action New York. In these roles, she has done political and media advocacy, peer services, community and capacity building, leadership development, legal support and yet she still can't figure out Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining us today, Kate. And thanks so much for uh, taking time to talk. So we had you on today because we wanted to talk about the FAFSA-SESTA uh, bill. And I was wondering if we could just start by having you give a general overview for people who aren't familiar with it. Sure, not a problem. So what passed out of the House and the Senate, and as of today, it still has not been signed into law. And it has not, I, I don't have a clear effective date, which is the date that the law would become effective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's really important to keep in mind that Right now, what we're talking about is still not uh, a law on the books. So the law has two pieces to it. And the first one is a lot of what we're talking about around um, expanding liability for websites that, quote unquote, knowingly facilitate trafficking. And while that sounds like it could be understandable and clear, it's not at all. It hasn't right, been defined right. in the law and it has it definitely hasn't been defined in anywhere in litigation. So what we're gonna see from that is kind of what we already have been seeing, where websites aren't necessarily going to be prosecuted, but the fear of that liability of being of having those charges filed means that they're gonna really clamp down on anything that they're not entirely sure about. Right. So what you're saying then is that what the law purports to do is to hold uh, websites liable for any sort of what is perceived to be sex trafficking that's going on on the websites. Exactly. So what they're saying is you should be liable for hosting this content. And, you know, if if trafficking is identified, you should be able to take it down very, very fast. Sure. And it's actually not that clear how it works. And the legal standard in the law is actually pretty high. You have to know what's going on and you still have to continue to facilitate it in specific cases. Okay. And so it can't be passive the way that it's set up now. Well, that's the thing is it's not really clear. And what they've been accusing Backpage of doing, which is, you know, we said that this was um, an ad for something and you didn't take it down. Well, that actually isn't necessarily as uh, clear cut as it sounds, because most of the things that get flagged, as we know, you know, maybe a bot is reviewing them, maybe it didn't make it to the right person. Maybe it's being flagged by a third party who they actually can't connect to that ad. And so it's it's really unclear and what they've been accusing Backpage of doing. And this is really what the problem is, is a standard that is not entirely clear and the expectations aren't clear. And so websites that aren't necessarily going to be able to fight the litigation to prove that are just going to say, you know what, we're not going to take the risk. Because what it also did in the law was say it's not just the federal government that can file these lawsuits. It's every attorney's general in every state. And so if you are a small website, if you're Google and you're like, bring it on, right? 51 sure. lawsuits, we get that every day. Sure. That's one thing. But if you don't have a litigation budget to prove to 51 different nuisance suits that you actually were doing your best and it's not entirely clear that you were are being held to a standard that you don't know. Why would you take that risk? Because it also comes with, depending on what they charge you with, incredibly high fees 
And under the second, so what the second part of the bill did was create a new federal law, which said that managers, users, operators of websites or listservs that host third party content and possibly apps, I, it, it's not clear. <laughs> yeah. Some of this jurisprudence just hasn't kept up with technology. Mm -hmm. Um, for facilitating or promoting prostitution, so not sex trafficking, but prostitution, right? Then you might be subject to uh, up to five, and depending on how big the site is, up to twenty-five years in federal prison. Wow. And so, yeah, so that's what websites are looking at. And so, you know, we're not necessarily talking about users facing increased criminalization directly from this law. But we are talking about websites having to decide whether or not they can take on the liability and clamping down and just kicking things off to feel safer, right. which is going to push people into spaces of higher criminalization. And so that is really kind of what we're looking at. And so this isn't necessarily about individual users directly having this law applied to them. It's about users being the collateral damage of the massive liability expansion and collateral damage of this law. So can we take a quick step back and just talk about Backpage for um, some of our listeners who may be less familiar? Um, sure. The, the law itself uh, purports to be a response to Backpage. Can you just maybe give us a, a little bit of quick background on what Backpage is and why this law is supposed to address Backpage? Not a problem. And yes, thank you for doing that. So what Backpage is, is a, a site where you can kind of go on and they have different sections and you post for a variety of things. You can post for jobs, you can post for personals, you can post for, I recently bought a chair off of Backpage. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of an... Kind of like Craigslist. Kind of like Craigslist. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It is really similar to Craigslist. Sort of a competitor. Um, yeah, and so they had an erotic services section. And the reason why it, Backpage is actually really unique and really, really important is because there were incredibly low barriers to entry. So when you're advertising to trade sex, there's a lot of websites where it's expensive to post an ad. It might be really difficult. You might have to give documentation that you don't have. Sure. Um, and so being able to go on Backpage meant that for especially marginalized folks that might be lacking that stuff, that might not have as much access to capital to post a month long, you know, couple hundred dollar ad, right? you could still work online. And the other part of that was Backpage was national. When you're posting in different cities, you know, maybe one website is great in, in Tallahassee, but it doesn't actually work in Dallas. And so, and especially when you're talking about, you know, trans workers and, and different types of, of marginalized individuals, Spani predominantly Spanish speaking workers, right. you know, Backpage was a place where in every single state, you knew you could still go to Backpage. And especially if you were escaping a domestic violence situation, if yeah. you were on the road and traveling, you knew that Backpage was going to be your safety net. Right. And so targeting Backpage in particular means targeting some of the most marginalized workers. And especially for folks who are trying to get off the street for the first time, Backpage was a way that they could move online and move into a space of, of less visibility and most importantly, of less violence. Um, there was right. a study So if you went out. on Backpage, you wouldn't have to be on the streets. Exactly. And there was a, a study that came out last year um, it's still going through peer review, so I want to be really transparent about that. Sure. Um, but they looked at different cities and compared um, a number of different elements and correlated to the opening of Craigslist erotic services section, there was a 17% drop in female homicides. And when you talk wow. to the authors, they very specifically said, you know, there's a lot of different facets of why this could be true. But the overwhelming answer is women in the sex trade make up such a high percentage of female homicides that giving sex workers access to safer spaces caused this drop. Wow. So let's fast forward then. Ultimately, so Backpage was being used quite a bit by sex workers to mm -hmm. trade sex. And the federal government, right, wanted to crack down on that sex trade, claiming that it was sex trafficking, right? Well, you know, it's important to remember that just like every single industry, there are levels of different forms of exploitation. 
Sure. And and when you're talking about trafficking, so trafficking is exploitation of another person through force, fraud, or coercion. And that can happen in domestic work. It, it's a huge problem in domestic work, actually, um, yeah. in agricultural labor, in construction work, and a lot of things where you know, the barriers to entry are lower. And so folks who are more marginalized have to access those spaces. You know, exploit <laughs> we're in a capitalist system. Exploitation is part and parcel of a lot of things that are very normal in right. our society. Mm -hmm. And the, and you know, the sex trade is no different, but it gets treated completely differently in the realms of how we address trafficking. Sure. You know, a couple of years ago, they found out that there was massive problems with trafficking and exploitation in nail salons. I didn't hear a single person call for the end of nail salons. And I have to tell you, <laughs> you know, getting your nails done is definitely a, a privileged activity. Right. And exactly. so, and so the sex industry isn't different in terms of trafficking. It's treated really differently. And the definition is is actually different in most states and on the federal government, where if you're under 18 in trading sex, regardless of whether there's force, fraud, or coercion, or even a third party, you are technically considered a trafficking victim, which right. is not true when, you know, one of the other things that I work on is just like more general <laughs> trafficking. And I have a bill that I love very deeply that is really important to me. And it's basically saying like 12 year olds maybe shouldn't be able to work eight hour days in uh, farm labor, especially in tobacco fields. Right. Like it's really, it's really <laughs> important to recognize that like that isn't considered trafficking. Right. But a 16 year old trading sex for a place to sleep because there's no shelter services that are competent to deal with, you know, gender nonconforming folks. Right. That's trafficking. Yeah. So it's treated very, very differently. You know, and, and Backpage is actually has a history of being incredibly responsive to law enforcement. If they do suspect that there is trafficking in an ad, they will send that ad on to have, uh, you know, someone follow up and try to track that stuff down. They are very, very responsive to dealing with trafficking on their site. Yeah. And so that's one of the scariest parts for these other websites that aren't under the gun all the time is that they see a website that is working with the FBI that's proactively sending along ads that they think are trafficking. And when the complaint is, well, a third party that we couldn't connect to an ad said, this is trafficking and please take it down. Like, that's an emotional story. Right. But is that something that we can expect of every single website? Right. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the implications that have already come out of this, even though it hasn't even become a law yet? Yeah. Within minutes of the bill being signed, the first website went down. And since then, I think two websites have completely closed. Reddit has uh, taken down a couple threads that were really specific to sex workers. Right. Um, there's a, a screening website that took away its communication tools, which was really important because, you know, screening and safety is so important <laughs> when it comes to the sex trade. And that was one of the things that we kept saying in a lot of the conversations was like, this is about harm reduction. This is about being able to stay safe. Yeah. Um, and being able to communicate with other people in the industry is such a, a cornerstone and a function of basic safety. And then another website, a review site pulled down its ads. And the implications around that are if you're reliant on this website, independent ads, you can have some control over. Right. Um, relying exclusively on reviews means that you have to get those reviews and you have to get them now faster. And so it really shifts the locus of power mm. in that relationship when, it, when you exclusively have to rely on another person right. to find more clients and to make sure that you are economically uh, solvent. Right, um, exactly. That person, yeah, that person has a lot more power. And, you know, think about what a bad review can do if that's the only mechanism that you have out there, especially if you're starting out. Yeah. Um, so those are the ramifications that we're already seeing. Not to mention, you know, it's it's caused a ton of fear. Hopefully, we'll not have ramifications on people, you know, offering things like referrals to each other. But we know that that kind of stuff happens too. That not only what this is doing is, you know, taking away advertising spaces, but six different really important platforms have either shut down or closed pieces right. in... And the bill was signed Wednesday. Yeah, that's so dramatic. Yeah. And so you're also going to, 
have people who say, I don't know what's going to go down next. I don't know if I, so I'm going to see every client. I am going to do everything I can. And that means making sure that trying to make sure you stay safe all of a sudden becomes a slightly lower priority mm. than right. making sure that you have enough money to survive if your ad goes down too. Um, so that's a safety issue then because providers are feeling sort of more pressured to not hold their boundaries or feeling more pressure to maybe violate certain boundaries that they generally hold when they're offering services in order to please customers because they are totally reliant on the customer's reviews? Um, it can be. I never want to paint anything with a broad swath. And I definitely don't want people to feel like that's what they have to do. I yeah. think for those who feel um, safe and secure holding their boundaries, do it. Absolutely stay safe. But the general trend is, you know, anytime we see increases in policing, and that's true whether we're talking about policing of online spaces or policing of, you know, street-based and public spaces, what happens is people feel more pressured to take clients. It's harder to do those negotiations because you're afraid of what's being said. And what we do see is just higher rates of violence, people taking on clients they wouldn't necessarily take on otherwise. Um, yeah. uh, intoxicated clients, clients you have a bad feeling about, mm. screening less, and then, you know, n leaving things like condom negotiation, that kind of, in spaces where it's a default, it sometimes all of a sudden becomes something to negotiate. Right. And so, yeah, so I, it's okay to commit to your boundaries it's really important to stay safe. Your safety is still valued because one of the other things that this conversation does is it makes people feel very dehumanized and very stigmatized yeah. and like no one cares. And that is not true. Yeah. And so I really want to make sure that folks still feel comfortable and still feel like their safety and like their health and their lives are really important. And if folks do have a situation where they don't feel like they can assert their boundaries and do get into a situation where, you know, they, they know might be a more precarious, more vulnerable situation, no matter what happens, if you are victimized, if you are violated, it is still not your fault. Right. Yeah. I want to go back to one of the things that you mentioned, which was that, which was providers giving like referrals for clients to other providers. Mm -hmm. It seems to me like a really important thing that happens in online spaces is community with other sex workers. And I think that there is some fear that that will be jeopardized in some way. Yeah, so the provisions of the law that were introduced in the House side that got added to it, it was called the 230 bill. And that's just a part of the Communications and Decency Act that said that platforms aren't liable for what's posted on their site. And so that was the piece of existing law that uh, they said was too much immunity. And that's what they're trying to chip away. Right. So what was added onto that was a, a provision that it was promotion and facilitation of prostitution piece. So that said that owners, managers, and operators of websites that host third party content who promoted or facilitated prostitution. Mm -hmm. And so that created a new federal crime. And I even I had a phone call with someone who said, you know, we didn't put users on there because we didn't want to criminalize sex workers. And I said very clearly, you know, I owned and managed and operated a listserv where people gave safety information and right. made referrals to each other. And so you need to know that because there were more than five people on that listserv, you just subjected me as a community organizer to 25 years in federal prison. Well, yeah, I was thinking about that, too, because we run a swap chapter in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I was wondering about, well... Can those sorts of uh, information sharing platforms... Right, like you make a Facebook page for the swap chapter and <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden are you, you know, trafficking under federal law? Like... So, so this is the challenge of the law. I mean, first and foremost, the way that a lot of state laws are written, a lot of this stuff is already criminalized. And so... What I, I keep trying to hopefully remind people, and granted, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm definitely not a clairvoyant. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> fair. <laughs> um, is, you know, look at the policing practices that are already existing. Mm -hmm. Those are probably not going to change. And so what we should be thoughtful of and what we should be responding to is a lot of protecting the spaces that we're on. And I try to remind people, like, look at terms of service. Look at who's hosting your website. 
look at the different services and tech services that you use and see how far out of the bounds something might look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that might be the best indicator of whether or not you should be worried about being kicked off a platform. Right. Is law enforcement going to go after community-based organizations? First off, they already are. And if they are, you're already going to know. Yeah. I Yeah. This isn't necessarily going to shift that because of FOSTA and SESTA, but criminalization of community organizations of sex workers is something that's already happening. Mm-hmm. And so you're looking at your local context is already going to be the best way to know whether or not you're in danger for this kind of stuff. And I always want to situate this in the context of, you know, folks who are criminalized for trading sex are the most visible workers and they're the, generally the most marginalized workers. So we're talking about criminalization in the context of, you know, people are busted for trading sex or busted for another charge and they're just visible because they're trading sex every single day. Right. And so as we stay safe and as we talk about, you know, advocacy, and I am so hopeful, like I love political advocacy. Um, it is my self care. <laughs> and I yeah. hope that this is a moment that catalyzes a lot of people to get engaged right. and to remember that this this is not new for our community. Backpage became Backpage because Craigslist shut down in 2010 and it didn't take a law. It took politicians saying horrible things about the owners. It took media and, you know, anti-prostitution folks standing outside of his house every day. Wow. That's what shut down Craigslist. And so before there was SESTA, there was the Save Act. This is nothing new. And how many have been PayPal accounts frozen and money kept, been kicked off platforms already. You know, Chase shut down how many porn stars bank accounts just because they were afraid of liability. And so we can take this incredible moment of outpouring and say, you know what? I don't want eight more years of this. I don't want to know what they can do in the next eight years. We can start really coming together to fight back right now. Yeah. Because rather than, pushing back on SESTA, I'd rather prevent the next one. Yeah. So maybe can you tell us a little bit about what kinds of organizing you're doing now and also maybe what people who are listening or perhaps who work in sex trade can be doing to uh, help with those organizing efforts? Sure. Um, So I've been working with uh, a couple of folks under the Let Us Survive and Survivors Against SESTA hashtag. And so if you go to survivorsagainstsesta.org, we're going to be documenting different ways that folks can plug in um, and through we're doing more political engagement and we're going to provide a lot more education and training around that to gear up for what I'm really stoked about, which is we're going to bring people together on June 1st Mm -hmm. um, to lobby and talk to your representatives. And if folks want to come to DC, if folks are in DC, we're going to be centering a lot of it there to be able to go and speak on the federal level. Um, We'll provide training and materials. We won't just like send you in on (laughs) prep. But also, you know, doing in district visits, sitting down with your city council members, sitting down with your state representatives, we'll make that available too. Okay. And you'll still get access to the same training, the same information. We'll help you set up those meetings and be able to really facilitate that. Because this conversation, we're also going to have a sign-on letter. <laughs> I know everyone loves sign-on letters. But what we're doing is saying, all right, you passed this bill. You were committed to passing this bill. Now we need you to commit to addressing violence against sex workers. Yeah. And the conversations that I have on the Hill every single time, they're not conversations about like, well, we don't care. They're conversations that say, I've never heard this before. I don't really understand how federal law plays out in people's lives who trade sex. Yeah. Please, can we keep this dialogue open? Well, that's really encouraging to hear. Yeah. And so it's time to start showing up and start saying, all right, you want to have this information? We're here in your office and we are going to be the most interesting meeting that you have today. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that sounds, uh, that's all really great. Yeah. So and how how are people going to access that training? We are figuring out the technical pieces and planning the training right now. But if you go to the website, um, we're putting up a form where you can, you can uh, plug in, say where you are, say what you're interested in. And we're going to make sure to make that available. We are, we're 
planning, you know, there's a lot of tools out there and we're really centralizing them on uh, this conversation in particular. We're already in contact with staffers in different organizations that are so excited to support this work and really excited to develop messaging um, that's accessible to staffers. Yeah, um, wow. Yeah. And we even have uh, staffers ready to say, ready to sit down and just have a conversation about like, this is what I'm facing. And this is what this conversation is like to me. And who really want to start building that relationship between policymakers and folks that trade sex. So that is going to be June 1st. Mm -hmm. Um, And on June 2nd, which is, uh, it's known as International Whores Day. It comes out of a 1975 protest that was where sex workers in uh, Lyon were, there was a huge crackdown that they were facing that was really compromising, especially their families and safer spaces. And so they marched to a church to find sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where we get the red umbrella from. And so, yeah, and it, it kind of spread throughout France and now is a really amazing day that's celebrated, especially through Latin America. And, and there's a huge contingent that uh, celebrates it every year. And so we are encouraging um, public demonstrations. We're going to give information about Know Your Rights for demonstrators. We're going to put information out there, kind of trying to encourage people for how to especially center the voices of the most impacted folks in mm-hmm. in public spaces, which can, which can be really hard for you know a criminalized and a stigmatized community. Um, right. But some tips on how to make sure that we don't lose those voices and mm-hmm. recognize that you know the privilege to speak out and the privilege to do activism is something that we are aware of yeah that's Um, great yeah and uh and the last thing that we're doing right now is pulling together some different legal minds from a couple couple different spaces to not only streamline a lot of the know your rights and safety information that's out there but also to give some tips on how to host and distribute this information in a way that's safe because you know i know when i was with swap nyc we were constantly in dialogue about like, what is it safe to say? What can we put on our website? What right. should we say in a webinar, you know, where anyone can log in? Yeah. And so we're hopefully going to have some recommendations about how to do harm reduction around that kind of stuff. You know, at the end of the day, it's a criminalized space. And so we can't guarantee safety, but there's things that we can do to try to reduce some of the, the challenges and the barriers and the risks that folks are taking to do really important community organizing. So um, we just had our first phone call last night. We have some next steps and we're hoping that in the next couple of weeks, we can start sending out information. Yeah, the work you're doing is really incredible. I really uh, thank you for that. <laughs> I, You know, it is it's such a privilege to like wake up and love what you do. And this is amazing. And it also is happening in a context of incredible, incredible work. And, you know, a lot of fear right now is about isolation. And it's about feeling like you're all alone and you can't reach out. And, you know, community organizing is such a way to address that and to recognize that as people fighting for social justice and economic justice and anti-policing work, Um, and reproductive justice, there's incredible, incredible organizing happening right now. Like I sent out the script that I had gotten from the dreamers. Like I got my next steps because I was talking to someone who works with indivisible. Um, You know, the, there's so much work happening already around bail reform. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at groups like song in, in the South and the rural reproductive justice organizing that they're doing, you know, we get to stand on the shoulders of amazing, incredible activists. And yeah. right now is a moment where we can do some amazing stuff and it is in a context of incredible social upheaval. And so I really encourage, you know, maybe sex worker rights actually isn't your jam, or maybe you don't you don't know if you're in a space to do that. Mm -hmm. There's incredible, incredible shit happening right now. So, you know, if this isn't it, like look at your local bail reform place, your anti-policing, you know, uh, BYP 100, uh, Black Lives Matter. Like there's a lot happening um, in this country right now. And we get to be a part of it. Yeah. (laughs) Can you direct people to where they could tap into a lot of this work? Yeah, I would definitely say we're going to keep updating survivorsagainstsesta.org. Um, also, with the, <laughs> the understanding that at some point we're going to have to switch to a URL that's going to last a little bit longer. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's where we're definitely putting up a lot of information. And hopefully one of the things that's going to be going up in the next day or two is also uh, some more local 
resources to plug into local community spaces, <laughs> including Swap Pittsburgh. Yeah, um, <laughs> great. <laughs> so yeah, to recognize that like this is an amazing multi pronged effort that is not in a bubble. Yeah, perfect. And where can people find your work? It is honestly, it is scattered throughout the internet. <laughs> um, but if people want to get in contact with me directly, like I am totally available to folks. Shoot me a DM. Um, I, I work with Reframe Health and Justice, which is a, a consulting collective that focuses on upending paradigms around uh, especially criminalization and economic justice. So that's where I am. But I'm a super accessible, like I, I'm just a community <laughs> organizer with a Twitter. <laughs> Perfect. And what's your Twitter handle? Uh, Kate Diadamo. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. We are at AVN today, so pardon the background noise. And we have with us comedian and porn star Wesley Woods. He is a two-time gay performer of the year, and he is currently the ambassador for I Want Empire. So first, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now? Um, well, I am currently sitting here at AVN with y'all, <laughs> um, but I just took over a position uh, with Brand Ambassador with I Want Empire. Previously, I Want Clips, that we also have the brands. I Want Gay Clips, which is launching, is the branch that I took over. I Want Phone.com, I Want Fan Club.com, and I Want Custom Clips.com. That's a mouthful. Oh, wow, that's a lot of things. Do you do all of those? So I am uh, actively doing some consultation work uh, behind the scenes with some of the things that we're actually building and putting into place and some of the protocols and manuscripts. And so I, I am actively doing some of that work as well. But my main focus right now is going to be I want gay clips. We're trying to target the gay market. I'm um, actively reaching out to all my porn star friends and trying to get them to get some of their content up and over. And we're doing some really great things. We're sponsoring a lot of events. We're putting a lot of money back into the artists and back into the industry. And we're trying to really build a platform where artists can not just survive, but thrive and really have a living. And that makes me excited. I, I want to offer that to myself and to my peers. So that's our big focus right now is pushing the I Want Gay Clips brand. So uh, when you say that you want artists to not just survive and thrive, what sorts of things are you uh, doing or implementing in order to kind of pursue that goal? Yeah, and you know, um, the industry has gotten away from artists for quite some time. And so um, I want empire, and, that, and that's what's beautiful. Is it's, the empire is everything that I just talked about. The gay clips, the it'll be trans clips, we'll have uh, custom clips, we'll have phone. We'll, we have all these avenues where artists can go on, make a profile, and make money. They don't even have to leave their, their house. They can literally have, I want, like, I want phone, for example. They can literally have phone conversations, old school phone conversations where they're charging people by the minute. It. And we also have fan club where it's kind of like a hybrid of like um, clips, but also kind of like a Twitter. And so you can upload naughties, but you can also just upload pictures and, and people can actually pay to now, you know, view your, their, uh, the club, the fan club. We also have where you can just upload your custom clips or um, maybe there's like jerk off instructional videos that you do. Like there's, there's, we've really allowed the artist to just be an artist and just create content and that content will be giving them residuals for as long as they have it up and are promoting it. Yeah, I actually am a phone sex operator. <laughs> so my when I'm not doing this podcast, so <laughs> so my ears just per perked up. I didn't actually know that you guys do that kind of service on your platform. We actually um, are just now in the launching process. So after we're done with this, I'm going to take you over to the booth and have you sign up because there's also some giveaways that we're doing as well. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting. I'm actually really excited too because I know a lot of fans and I hate using that word because we're all fans of each other, really. I mean, we're all in this together, regardless of who you are, what you're doing. But I, I like the personalized kind of approach, and, and I'm a dirty talker. And so <laughs> I, I like to get a little nasty and let them have it. <laughs> you know, like my love language is like words of affirmation. And so I, that's how I feel, and that's how I receive love. And so I think that's how I'm really good at sending love out. And so I'm really excited about the phone, the phone app. Yeah, that's really awesome. So you say you're a comedian in addition to a sex worker. I want to know more about that. How do you do you blend those two together, and, uh, and and what kind of comedy are you doing? 
Uh, I always get that question. They're like, are you naked on stage? I'm like, no, I don't go that far. Although I have in a show and that was not, I didn't receive a check afterwards. But that's another the story. Um, well, you know, I, I started doing uh, stand-up before I started doing porn. And I actually um, wanted to not just be another gay comic. I wanted to push the boundaries a little further. I wanted to have conversations a little bit more. I, I wanted to more, more or less kind of like, you know, talk the talk and walk the walk and i thought porn just seemed like a natural fit to be a sex positive comedian and so that's really kind of where it comes uh where my comedy comes from it's a lot of like sex positivity there's a lot of humor and sex what happens on uh set um and i also talk a lot about my family a lot of people uh people who know me know that i'm i'm extremely close with my family my older brother played football in the nfl my younger brother's a pastor and does missionary work and there's tons of material just in that sentence alone <laughs> Um, and so I, I have a lot of uh, a, a great time just really um, normalizing sex and porn. And I think it's it's something that's needed. We are people um, and sex should be talked about in a different way for for once in our lives. Not the heteronormative way that we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, speaking of heteronormativity, I saw on your uh, profile that you also are really interested in sex education that's non-heteronormative. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, um, again, being a comedian and porn star, I don't know all the correct verbiage sometimes, but what I do know, and I don't know how to go around the right way of implementing it, but what I do know is that from my experience and, and some of my friends' experience and having these conversations and feeling comfortable enough to have ask questions and, and, and read up for myself and, and, and sit with my own thoughts and experiences, I, I, I do know that what we're teaching kids in school or at home or anywhere, if we even are, I mean, really is a very one man, one woman, forever and ever, amen kind of way. And that's just setting people up to fail and to be miserable and to feel different and to feel weird. And we're not allowed to tell, we, we talk about our soul in this country as, you know, godly. And we're, we're going to go to this place eventually, but we're, we do a really shitty job at, at, at showing love and compassion down here um, as God's people. Um, and so I think the conversation of sex and sexuality needs to change because it's, it's really holding people back from getting to connect with each other and a soul purpose. Your soul came to this life for a reason, you know, not, not this physical body that we've been having. You know, and I always make the joke, people are like, oh, my God, you're so beautiful. And I'm like, well, please stop saying that because I've done nothing for this. Literally nothing. I just happened to wake up one day and I was conscious and like trying to figure shit out. And that's what we're all trying to do. We don't have the answers. Well, like in fairness, you are a very good looking person. <laughs> but, but, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, tell people where they can find you. Uh, you can find me on Instagram or on Twitter at the Wesley Woods. I'm also on Facebook, Wesley Woods. But just a reminder, uh, well, it's not even a reminder because no one knows this, but if you are happening to Google Wesley Woods, make sure you type in porn star because there is a church camp that I decided to pick my porn name after. So there you go, Wesley Woods. All right, thanks so much for talking to us. So we're here with Chelsea Poe, who's a filmmaker, performer, and director. She's currently working for Trouble Films. You're known for being an outspoken advocate of trans issues in the adult industry. So let's start there. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Um, yeah. So I got into porn because I was really influenced by performers like Stoya, Sasha Gray, who were really doing extreme performance and like gangbangs and stuff, but mm -hmm. still being extremely vocal about sex workers' rights and feminism and not afraid to speak their mind about the industry, even if it wasn't popular. That's what I really wanted to do when I came into the industry. So I started... Working with mainstream trans sites, and at first everyone was like, oh, cool, you're doing your own thing. And then at one point, I was looking at all this stuff I was shooting, and there was all these slurs on it, like she-male and tranny and 
all this really fucked up language that is now so outdated, even in porn. Right. So um, I started this petition to remove slurs from porn for from cis own sites because I don't think any cis person should be profiting off trans slurs. If yeah. a trans person wants to reclaim it, more power to them. I think that's amazing. But so I made that petition and essentially all those companies were super hostile to it for quite a while. How many so, people signed your petition? I think about 3,000. Wow. Yeah. But those companies were like, so it's only 3,000 people. Wow. So it was like this whole thing of like, <laughs> See, I think okay. that's a whole a lot of people too. I did too. But yeah. um, so there was all these issues and I essentially got blacklisted for mainstream trans porn. So I just started shooting all my own stuff with Trouble Films, and I eventually got into the role of being a director for the company. I moved to California to start working for um, Kink Live, and I've linked up with Trouble Films and just our DIY ethics, super similar. We're both from DIY punk scenes and mm-hmm. have similar politics. So trying to be progressive in this industry and advocate for sex worker rights and better workplace rights um, led me to Trouble Films. So I've been making films there for the last three years and I think I've made like five or six. Whoa. Yeah. Nice. So going back for a second, Mm -hmm. um, in what ways were they really hostile? Because I know that there's been some change and do you think that your petition like helped to bring about some of that change? I hope so. AVN said it did. So that's cool when any media source that's repable is saying what you did had a change on it. The It used to be called the Tranny Awards and... The year after I went and I spoke to a few press things, I think I spoke to Vice and some LA magazine about how I thought the slurs were not really acceptable. And a year later, they changed it, which was really amazing with the name of the award show. And then this last year, both Ruby and a site called Shemale Strokers both changed their names to things that are definitely less offensive. I think they might be a little bit wordy now. (laughs) I I, I think you need to figure out some wordplay. He's like... Um, so what, what are they now? So the Tranny Awards became the Transgender Erotica Awards, which I think okay. is a little wor- wordy. Yeah. I just be like, the Trans Porn Awards. <laughs> right. um, yeah. And then Shemale Strokers became Transational Fantasies, which I think is also a little <laughs> bit wordy. I don't know. That one's at least clever. I, I, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's all about like trans girls coming really hard. And I'm like, you should definitely do like a super squirt squirters like pun right right yeah like with the font like get as close as you can to that company without getting sued by them that's what i would do but (laughs) um but there's been a lot of progress and even at expos awards there weren't anything with real slurs against trans women the most it went to was um ts or transsexual um i was talking Mm -hmm. to my roommate about that and she was like transsexual sounds like if you're describing straight sex is like this movie's called penis and vagina five you know (laughs) It's just like a little bit wordy. So, um, <laughs> penis and vagina five, um, coming to trouble film soon, I guess. I don't know. But, um, I think there's a lot of progress being made that I can now just be like, I really don't like how there's, I mean, it's all parts of capitalism that you're going to have people on the top making way more money who are doing less labor than people on the bottom. Sure. And, um, I think with, so mainstream trans sites, there is taking advantage of homeless trans people who need the money Mm -hmm. and maybe aren't getting rights to it down the road and they're just getting paid a flat rate of oh, okay. something that's not a lot of money um, compared to mainstream cis rates or more established performers um, in trans porn. Well, the men who run these sites are millionaires and can right. fly back and forth between Europe and here every like weekend or whatever. Right. So right. I think income inequality needs to be talked about in porn just like as any other industry. Um, in- industry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask kind of an open ended question Mm -hmm. and see what you think about. There is and has been for some time like a discussion of ethical porn. And it seems like this is part of, you know, what it might mean for porn to be ethical. Talking about a couple of things here, like paying performers fairly or Mm -hmm. um, compensating them equally, but also like uh, respecting people's own identities and the way that they Mm self-identify and trying to like yeah kind of respect that representation seems Mm -hmm. to be also like a dimension of ethics but so I guess my question is what do you think about that idea of ethical porn and is that something like that speaks to you or do you think about what you're doing in kind of different terms I mean I guess that's an overall 
overarching thing of my porn, but I feel like ethics within, I'm definitely lean anarcho-socialist. Like, I think everything should just be performers making stuff for each other because I feel like that's the way you can eliminate all this stuff of people who are making money who necessarily shouldn't be making the money off the hard labor of sex workers. Yeah. I That's where I feel, um, which is most important, where it's a true collaboration. I don't... There's always going to be power dynamics when it's one person on top paying everyone less than they're making. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if... I mean, I think ethical porn or ethical anything under capitalism is a little bit flawed because there's inherently gonna be like not everyone's gonna get paid the same wage yeah Yeah. and it's not always gonna be fair and i think the way for me to break that down is when i work with people it's a collaboration everyone gets the rights to whatever they're doing unless it's a paid gig that they already agreed to but i try to do as much collaboration as much content trade as possible and that's what most people are doing this avn Mm -hmm. because i feel like the industry shifted so much away from studios giving you 500 or 800 dollars to do a scene sure to now where you can shoot an entire movie with your friends over a weekend (laughs) and everyone's having a great time yeah um i haven't shot anything with any mainstream sites in a minute just because of um It's just not worth the effort because Mm -hmm. you might have a five day shoot where you're up at like 5 a.m. trying to shoot a porn scene. Yeah. And is that really (laughs) worth the stress to make two, three grand? Or would you rather make a movie on your own? Yeah. Have a lower overhead and then make all the profit off of it. Yeah. I get what you're saying. So do you, you mostly do trades? I do a lot of trades. With other performers? Um, Yeah. Trouble Film funds quite a few of the projects, um, just like a scene or two of it. Mm -hmm. But I like doing trades because I feel like everyone has invested interest and I feel like when it's a true collaboration, you're going to get the best overall product. I came from a DIY punk scene where I would never imagine writing a song or whatever and just being like going to my band and being like, we're going to play this. (laughs) Right. You know, like (laughs) I want porn scenes to be the same thing. I want everyone to come in. I want the videographer to have a say. I want the person on set who's sitting there to be like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Or Mm -hmm. that's not looking good. And I want the other performers to be involved. And I think for me, all my projects are about collaboration. And it's really an art thing to me more than anything where I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking about making films and it's like my life. So I think it's deeper for me than just like ethical company thing, I guess. Can we drill down on that for a second? Because I think a lot of our listeners... Um, who might be outside of the adult industry Mm -hmm. may not fully understand how trade content works. So could you just like take a minute to describe how that works for like outsiders? Yeah, totally. So basically when performers work together, everyone has a fan base and everyone has social media followings. Twitter is where most of the industry stuff goes on in porn. Some people have Tumblr and Instagram, but Twitter is where most of the business goes down. Right. So, um, with content trade, there's one of two ways I usually do it. We all come in, um, we either share a videographer and we all just get the raw footage. You edit it and then you can just release on your own for whatever we mm-hmm. agreed to prior. So I'm like, I want to use this for this lesbian movie and the other performers like, I want to put it on my clips for sale. So, we'll so then do- people will edit it differently? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sometimes we do that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we do one edit and mm-hmm. we just try to release around the same time mm-hmm. where... There's also times where there's two different videographers where I have a videographer and they have a videographer. So the scenes could look drastically different and definitely with the edit. Sure. So I think it's a way to, you know, work smarter than harder because sometimes Mm -hmm. I've also done content trades where I shot with someone. They're like, I'll shoot with you in a month for your project. Yeah. So I think there's all different kinds of ways. But I think just when the performers and just sex workers or any workers are able to handle the stuff between themselves mm-hmm. where everyone's feeling fairly comp- compensated and can actually use the work, I think it's positive. And I think whether it's music, whether it's anything, I think it should all be like that and it all be between the artists and the performers and everything mm-hmm. actually working together and not an outside force taking the footage and yeah. then profiting off of it. Sure, yeah. I actually think I, I've never really thought about this before, but I think that the idea of having like different videographers who are shooting the exact same scene mm-hmm. It's actually really interesting artistically. Yeah, we've um when we shot with Bailey J a while back, I believe we did the same thing where mm-hmm. we had two videographers and it was totally looked like two different scenes basically, yeah. <laughs> just in the same hotel and it was great. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. It seems like you're making two radically different things. Like there's a part of me that wants to really nerd out right now. <laughs> And talk about this essay from like the 1930s, this guy, Walter Benjamin, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it's called, what is it? It's called Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. It talks about that same kind of thing and like how the invention of cameras and different technology lets us like experience things from different angles. Mm-hmm. And like that creates like such a fundamentally different experience of the thing but yeah i just like this idea of like there's art in the performance but there's also like art in the cinematography and yeah and and, like you know it's one thing to say that but like having different people and like different cinematographers and different visions involved in the process i think like brings that to life like it's really interesting to think that you can bring two different visions to life in the same collaboration and then like you know idea like compare them and see how they're Mm -hmm. both realized like there's just something so like interesting about the art of that yeah i mean i'm very intentional with who i choose for videographers who i choose for directors i mean not directors editors because if i am working with a director it's someone who i specifically want to work um, with for that scene but it's a lot of um with the whole trade style it's a lot of self-directing because it's the two performers know what they already want to do right and they kind of hash out with the videographer but um i'm super intentional with my editors i always want it to be queer people so they have like the queer eye for what they think is attractive and stuff and like the queer gaze i guess kind of like the male mm-hmm. gaze but yeah. <laughs> um that's really important to me and same with videographers i don't think i would work with anyone who's not within my world or yeah you know i think there needs to be that intimacy between any people who are working together where it just feels kind of awkward and you know mm-hmm. I just yeah. feel like um, I really am about working with a lot of the same people on the other end. I work with Ray Thread a bunch. I work with Courtney Trouble as a videographer and editor. Um, I work with Asia Pop often. My editor is, um, their Twitter is Film Dyke. They're amazing. So I'm just always kind of working with the same group of people over and over again. Yeah. Do you feel like AVN has been a good experience for you this year? Yeah, it's been great. Um, I got half of my next film done called um, Femme for Femme 2. I released the last one in August. I did an interview with Rolling Stone, which was really rad. Because, like, everyone, when they're 16, they're like, oh, my God, Rolling (laughs) Stone, right? What did they interview you for? Um, Just, like, a thing on um, AVN. It's actually with Tina Horn, who I interviewed for their podcast. Why are people into that? When I had food poisoning in Brooklyn. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was, like, on the couch in Brooklyn, like, dying. And they're like, do you want to do a podcast? I'm like, if you can come and get on this couch right now. (laughs) I really like their podcast. Yeah. Where was I? Oh, AVN. Yeah, and then... um, I got to go on stage with Lil Wayne. Yeah. So that was great. <laughs> I'm like, we were like, just uh, somehow got up there and then Complex just tweeted a picture of it. So I'm like, awesome. Great AVN. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can go home now and be satisfied. Yeah, I'm so ready. I'm like, how many more hours left? Like six? I'm like, let's go. <laughs> so can we circle back to this notion of like the queer eye or the queer gaze? Because yeah. that's so like interesting to me. Like, what is it do you think that queer people bring to yeah bring to cinematography or directing like what do you think those differences um might be than a cishet person you know i really don't know many straight people in this industry um because i've really surrounded myself with like all my friends and i've literally just been making stuff with them over and over again and obviously most of the um, performers i work with are queer but for me my intended audience is queer people I've been really lucky to get some more mainstream stuff with um, being on trench coat um, where you have my films like next to Stoya or next to Caden Cross. So it's been opened a bit more for mainstream and getting nominations and stuff, but my intended audience is um, queer people. So I always try to do um, specifically, usually a trans queer woman editor, just because I know what they want to see in porn, probably what I want to see in porn Mm -hmm. and what other trans people want to see. So what do you feel like you want to see in porn? I Well, personally, I watch a lot of lesbian BDSM, like really mm-hmm. rough lesbian BDSM on my own time. Um, <laughs> I also really love aesthetic porn, like um, Four Chambered is one of my favorite sites. I've gotten to work with them a few times. What Trenchcoat's doing, all the porn they're curating, I think is super beautiful and totally awesome. And I think that's like, like well, being on Trenchcoat's been like my dream for the industry because I wanted to make queer stuff but have some mainstream yeah. validation mm-hmm. over it yeah, yeah. yeah and like be next to mainstream porn that i really look up to because it's artistically great and it's hardcore so i think for me it was so much about wanting to do that yeah with my goal in porn so 
obviously I'm still never going to abandon my base of queer people. And that's what I always want to make stuff for. But that mainstream porn got on board at least the last four years that I've been able to go here. It's been rad. I'm just like waiting for my next project where I freak them out and they all leave. (laughs) I'm going to keep making it. Like I've been making this shit before people cared. So I'm just going to keep going. So I have the questions about um, the economics of queer porn because what I keep hearing from a lot of people is that there's not very much money in queer porn or there isn't the money in queer porn that there is in, you know, het porn. And has that been your experience or do you think that there is a market for queer porn? I mean, I think there's definitely, I think there's a market. I mean, it's about keeping your overhead low, like anything in this industry. If you're spending $25,000 on a movie, still you're losing money. Your company's probably going to go out of business in the next five years. Um, So I think it's about keeping overhead low. I'm really good at finding cheap travel deals. I'm always able Mm -hmm. to travel and tour my films. We're going um, back to Europe in March um, to do a tour with Fucking Against Fascism. But I think it's just about keeping overhead low. Um, my last yeah. film, Femme for Femme, I made all my money back in like a month and a half. Oh, so that's I'm great. like, for any film, that's yeah, that's awesome. But um, I don't know. I think it's just about keeping overhead low and knowing how to do stuff. Right. And I think content trade definitely does that. And I think yeah. with any art thing, you need side hustles. And yeah. also, I'm living in the most expensive city in the country. <laughs> So I'm like, everyone has a side hustle. So I'm just like, all right, I have to make three films a year. I'm camming every day. Yeah, but yeah. But I think that also pushed me to like work harder and do more than if I was still right outside of Chicago or something where I probably make one film a year because you don't have the demand to be like, you have sure. to stay, you know, yeah. pay rent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. So you're going to Europe to tour your film. What yep. does that look like? And what are you, what is your film? Um, my film, Swag Against Fascism, it's kind of in the same vein as my last film, um, Crew Porn Americana, that I did a world tour with. The way I want to do these tours, this one specifically, where um, I'm touring with Courtney Trouble for the Euro leg of this and a collective in London, Berlin called Sluts for Sluts, who are super amazing. And I met at um, the Berlin Porn Film Fest and I worked with them um, on a scene for Fuck Styles 3 that just came out last month on Trouble Films. So what we do is I come from a DIY scene. I used to be a concert promoter. So I like to just do four filmmakers on each night, basically. So everyone gets 45 minutes to scream whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do a DJ between every single set. So we'll have the energy of basically a show. And we just want to have as much porn showed in a context that people want to actually go out and see it. Yeah. um, Because... I feel like particularly queer porn, it just doesn't just have to be masturbation, you know? (laughs) Like, you can go out and be like, oh, my God, that's a really cool movie. I'm happy I saw that. Um, And, yeah, the Berlin Porn Film Fest does a lot of the screenings. Mm -hmm. I think there's something super interesting about the sex publics that those sort of screenings create that you don't get in very many contexts. Yeah, Berlin. Especially with people consuming most of their porn in private. I I think it also depends on um, what country you're in, too. In Berlin, there's weekly and monthly porn screenings around town. Wow. So mm-hmm. there, it's just a super normal thing. London has um, quite a few fests there as well. So those two cities have always been ter- good turnouts whenever I've been there. Mm-hmm. I don't know about Paris. I don't know how often I have screenings there. We're going to Paris as well. And then Amsterdam. Um, my family is all originally from Amsterdam. So I'm really excited to go back. And yeah. the sex work tradition is just so deep there. Sure. And and yeah. also the queer art tradition. So I'm really excited to go there. And I'm hoping it's a good turnout. But I also went to Tokyo last year and people wow. loved it. Just hearing like what the porn industry is in Japan is very different. It's very much still on the studio model. And okay. you don't have performers making their own content. So just being around other performers there who are like, whoa, you can make your own film <laughs> yeah. was really amazing. And just seeing... Um, Having those cross-cultural conversations was really important, I think. But it's been... The United States has been hit or miss. We've had... For, like, every... I feel like we have two good... Two or three good screenings, and we have one with a small turnout in North America. So I think it just depends. I think it's just a cultural thing on... The United States is still a little bit weirded out by porn, but it was in the 70s where you had Deep Throat being... You know, in every box office. And you had Jackie Kennedy going to see Deep Throat and the New York Times writing reviews about it. So I feel like it just depends on 
if it's going to come back around in the States. Yeah, I think the pendulum's swinging back to some degree. I mean, you know, we're from Pittsburgh, which is a, you know, small and not particularly progressive (laughs) town. But, you know, at least there has been some sorts of events like that. Yeah, there's been a film fest there. Yeah, I had something in it a few years back. Right. And the energy around those is pretty good. And like... Queer, queer organizing and sex worker mm-hmm. organizing. There's starting to be a energy there. Yeah, and I see that bubbling up. And I guess I say that because part of me is like, yeah, obviously it's a business for you, but don't underestimate the amount of social good that even those, you know, less than um, desirable turnouts in North American cities are doing. Because I think that in a lot of cases, those kinds of events are really laying the groundwork mm-hmm. for exactly what you were saying, Jesse, the kinds of sex publics that over time, you know, you have people who, um, who are who are excited not only to see the event, but to also see each other and mm-hmm. to also build something to get you know a sex positive space together even as the um performers who are touring Mm -hmm. you know move through and different performers come in with different events i also view it as a band like i feel like you have to build these communities in each city like even just for you as a performer to be like oh i can go back and then someone will be like oh i want to see the new film or whatever right yeah and seeing people like bruce the bruce who've been touring the world with their films for you know 20 30 years It's amazing just to see, like, you can have a feasible career on making films. Yeah, I, you know, I have to say I love talking to you and Courtney, and I also come out of uh, music scene and and organizing. And, you know, before I was working in this industry, uh, you know, I also ran some tech conferences and, you know, did other sorts of things. And I just always thought that way, that kind of DIY, like, Everything I do, I organize as if it's a punk rock show. Yeah, you know I mean that's I mean? like the only way I know. I'm it's like the, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and it's the same thing. Like that friend who I've organized everything with came out of the music scene in uh, Chicago, and it's the mm-hmm. same. And I just don't know how to do it any other way. So when I talk to you, uh, you know, it just makes so much sense to me, kind of intuitively. And I, I hear you when you grow up doing that. It's just hard to imagine doing things any other way. Yeah, I can't, like, date people who weren't part of any DIY scene or, like, (laughs) because it's so hard because it's, like, such an important thing of how you become yourself because, you know, you're going to shows when you're 12 or 13 until 20 and it's like, oh, that's how you learn to run shit and to manage your life even, you know? I mean, it's honestly the same thing with this podcast. Like, it's exactly how we approach it. And I mean, of course, it's a much smaller operation. But like, you know, we very much are like trying to be embedded in this, you know, space Mm -hmm. and collaborative and collaborative with each other and, you know, and like, I still feel like, you know, it's still like we're a scrappy little DIY thing that we're just kind of doing on the fly and interacting with people who, you know, we think deserve a platform mm-hmm. and who we just like genuinely want to talk to and, you know, mm-hmm. like who we feel are like part of our yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your people, yeah. Yeah, we're I got like, you. we know a lot of interesting people who have a lot of interesting things to say. So let's make a podcast. <laughs> totally. We'll talk to all the interesting people. <laughs> yeah, I totally feel like just I'm from a pretty small town. It's like a million people. So it's um not very big. But like the whole thing with art when I was growing up, I'm like, if you play a show and everyone in the room's into it, just a room. Doesn't matter. It's a hundred people. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And just being able to like go to London. Like I went to London for the first time. It was the first time I was out in North America. Never been there before, and I did a screening, and there was, like, 80 people there, and people were, like, crying to me after it, being like, thank you. And I'm just like, (laughs) that's it. Like, I don't give a fuck about awards. I don't care about anything else that, like, you could have that moment and say you've never been to before. That's, like, more rewarding than anything, you know? Like, that's what I'm in it for more than anything. That's why I think about this last year. It's not about, oh, I got this many nominations. I got this or this or this. It's those connections and being like i can make art that affects people on the other side of the world and that even makes them want to go out of their house and do stuff yeah you know like i'm like i don't know i don't go out to see much stuff from like artists from london who are in a town for a day you know yeah yeah Yeah. like it's a really cool thing to be a part of just being like knowing that your work has touched so many people around the world and Mm -hmm. it's a mindfuck to think about because you're just living your everyday life i'm like just you know Doing basic stuff in Oakland, like (laughs) 
walking to the grocery store, taking out the trash or hanging out with my cat. Like, right. yeah. you don't think about is like this whole other world. And then you yeah. go out there and you're like, wow. And how your work is like connecting to other people. And yeah. Yeah. I think that's the end goal of all art, media, anything. Just like, you know, yeah. if you can make a difference in someone's life, that's what it's about. Yeah. Well, that's a good note to yeah. end on. Um, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Chelsea Poe 666 or Instagram at fake Chelsea Poe. <laughs> okay. Someone catfished yeah. my <laughs> partner as me. So, <laughs> yep. All right. Well, thank, thank you so you much so for much. joining us. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. A special thank you to our wonderful guests. You can find Wesley Woods on Twitter at the Wesley Woods, Kate Diadamo on Twitter at Kate Diadamo, and Chelsea Poe on Twitter at Chelsea Poe six six six. I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at Sapio Textual. I'm PJ Sage, and you can find me at Peach Sage. We would like to remind you that we do have a Patreon account, and we would appreciate your support. Please visit Patreon.com/slash Peep Show Podcast. Thanks to Joe Kennedy for the music. The show is produced by Jesse and PJ Sage. Signing off. Have a great week. Oh my God.